Hey guys, welcome to the purchase and sell agreement walkthrough. Thank you for taking the time to actually click on the link. Uh, if you were coming from the ebook, I appreciate you reading the ebook. If you're, you know, viewing this on YouTube, then hopefully, you know, you get some very quality information out of this. I would like to start off this walkthrough by really urging you guys not to ever really refer to the purchase and sell agreement as a contract preferably refer to it as an agreement rather than a contract i've noticed a better response with sellers i feel like with a contract it really comes off more intimidating versus an agreement an agreement comes off you know like an agreement versus a contract um so that's just my advice uh, of course do as you please but that's just my advice i've noticed better response with agreement versus a contract all right, so starting off, this agreement is made this sixth day of April 2020. And the font here is at size 18. You always want to make sure this font, you know, really is bigger than a template font. The template font is at 10. This is at 18. This is bigger than this, as you can see. So between sellers, John and Jane Doe, and that'll be whoever your seller's name is for uh, this the template font right here is at 12 and buyers d'angelo simmons and this is at 12 as well which is bigger than the regular font in or assigns this is very huge you have to make sure any contract you use for the purchase of real estate if you're looking to wholesale just make sure it has in or assigns whether you use this contract or any other one just make sure it's in or assigns because if you don't, then your title company will actually tell you to make sure you add that in there and make sure you get it re-signed with this specific words, you know, this specific uh, wording in the actual agreement. So just save time by making sure that is in there whatever with whatever contract you use. All right. So the street address for the sake of this, we use one, two, three, four Main Street. And one thing I want to point out for you guys is that you have to make sure it's this underline is selected in order for you to write on any one of the lines. As you can see, the underline is selected here and as well as here. It's always selected. And I make sure that I have you guys a PD or excuse me, a Word document versus a PDF. Because with a Word document, you're actually able to edit it online, you know, through Word or even through Google Docs um, versus a pdf version you have to you can still edit it online but you have to go through different apps and stuff so i just wanted to make it e as easy as possible for you guys to edit phoenix arizona uh, is the city the state uh, and the zip code is 85008 legal description property will be sold as is where it is and again this is at size 14 i'm not going to keep pointing out for you guys just want you to you know be aware every time i click on the font that you know what size it is i found this this specific the way i got these uh, sizes for each of these words on each line works the best it looks most presentable so legal description property will be so as is where is the reason why it is as is where is obviously we know we're purchasing the property as is where is you've maybe even told the seller you're purchasing the property as is where is all this does all this does is just give the seller that extra just peace of mind knowing that their their property is being purchased as is where it is you're not expecting them to make any repairs or any adjustments to the property prior prior to the actual uh, closing of the property all right so that's why you have that there earnest money deposit ideally it should be zero if you negotiate correctly your earnest money deposit should be zero but one thing i want to let you guys know is you know don't be intimidated if you have to put up a thousand dollars earnest money I'll tell you why here in this earnest money clause, number one. But uh, another big tip, never let a deal go if you have to put up $50 in earnest money. You know, you spend $50 on things that can't make you $5,000, $10,000. So obviously be willing to put up $50 earnest money if you are in a position where you could potentially make $5,000, $10,000 or even $1,000. All right. So never shy away from that. Cash and seller at closing, hundred thousand. Total purchase price, hundred thousand. These two always stay the same. Just make sure you keep those the same, and you'll be good. All right. So clause number one, and the reason why we're going to go through each clause is because you want to make sure you know what you're talking about, right? You don't want to be out in public and you have seller for one, two, three, four Main Street calling you, 
and they're calling you asking you about the purchase and sell agreement what does line number one mean and you don't have a clue what line number one is so study this purchase and sell agreement like it's your homework you know if you played any sports this should be your playbook this is everything that you need right here in order to build that confidence when you're speaking with the seller so with the earnest money clause uh, it's to be deposited with a licensed title company or attorney within five business days right of acceptance and ratification of offer five business days is crucial right the reason why it's crucial is because if you have to put up a thousand dollars earnest money remember i told you don't shy away from it it's nothing to be intimidated about because if you make this agreement on a thursday right if this agreement is made on a thursday then you have friday monday tuesday wednesday in that following thursday to make sure that your thousand dollars is put into escrow now during that time and the reason why it's you know you skip the weekend is because it's business days business days are monday through friday not including saturday sunday all right so the reason you don't need to be intimidated is because you actually have time to go out and find your end buyer within that uh, ideally you know seven days obviously but within that five business day time frame you have time to go out and find your end buyer and they'll put up the thousand dollars earnest money into escrow gladly if the deal is a great deal they'll gladly put up their money into escrow and you know they'll be able to you'll be able to be on track of getting paid your seller will have the peace of mind knowing that you got skin in the game with the thousand dollars earnest money and you'll have a peace of mind knowing that you have a serious buyer because they put up the thousand dollars earnest money so just allow your negotiating skills and your hustle to really get you there for you to be able to close a deal no matter the amount of earnest money to put up because you have the time and that's all you need Line number two, clause two, prorations, impounds, security deposits. Loan interest, property taxes, insurance, and rent shall be prorated as of the date of closing. All security deposits shall be transferred to buyer at closing. So you will tell your seller, hey, look, seller, don't worry about loan interest. We're not, you know, taking over your loan. Property taxes, however, that is something that will be prorated at the date of closing. And sellers may take that one of two ways. You know, sellers may not even ask you about it, right? Some sellers don't even pay attention to it on the HUD statement. But some sellers are going to fight tooth to nail to make sure they don't have to pay the uh, prorated property taxes. They feel that that is wrong and they feel like you should pay it, right? So if they say, you know, I don't want to pay the property taxes, you're paying it or I'm walking away, then reason with them, tell them, hey, look, this is how the process typically works. You have to pay the property taxes. But at the end of the day, get the deal done right so if the seller's telling you hey look i'm not paying the property taxes and they just don't want to pay it or they're going to walk away then go to your end buyer tell your end buyer hey can you cover these property taxes prorations if they say no then you cover the property taxes prorations all right if you're uh, set to make five thousand dollars on a deal and the property tax prorations are only five hundred dollars for that semester then you know what's five hundred like you still get 4500 right so don't complain about that because a person like me will go ahead and cover those property taxes and i'll swoop in and make that 4500 and be on to the next deal that's how you got to look at it abundance mindset all the time insurance tell your seller you don't have to worry about that because your end buyer is going to have their own insurance or you know for the sake of speaking with the seller tell the seller hey i'm going to have my own insurance don't worry about that Rent should be prorated as of the date of closing. So what that means is, you know, if you purchase the property, close on the property, you know, halfway through the month, then the renter will only have to pay half of the month's rent. So if the month's rent is $1,000, then the renter will only have to pay $500 that month, which would be great for them. I'm sure they'll love it. And all security deposits should be transferred to buyer at closing. So if the renter had to put up $1,500 in order to secure their apartment or house or whatever their rental unit is, uh, that $1,500 will be transferred to your end buyer as of the date of closing, right? Because it's a security deposit, which means that the renter will have to get their deposit back at the end of their lease. You know, as long as they don't mess up the property and you don't have horrible tenants, they'll get their money back. So just make sure that the seller knows that that is expected to be transferred at title closing. Closing date and transfer of title. This transaction shall close on or before May 1st, 2020. Closing will be held at TBD and seller agrees to transfer its marketable title free and clear of all encumbrances except those listed and pay any required state taxes or stamps required to record deed and mortgage. This is a big one. The reason why it's a big one is 
you know, for one, you close on or before May 1st. So tell your seller, hey, look, we will get you closed out by May 1st on or before. We can sometimes close before that, but typically it'll be around May 1st. So it'll be TBD. Closing will be held at TBD because it's to be determined, right? So what you need to do before you even get in the ring to get this purchase and sell agreement signed is have three title companies in mind, right? That you typically use, whether it's true or not. That just helps it, you know, you build confidence knowing that you got that in your back pocket. If the seller asks, what does TBD mean and why is it to be determined? You tell the seller it's to be determined because we actually deal with three different title companies and you name off those title companies and you say, it actually just depends on which title company is available within our closing time frame. Some title companies may not be available on that day, but other title company will. So we just like to keep that open when it comes to the point of closing. The actual reason is TBD is because, you know, if you have an end buyer who likes to close with their title company and you have a relationship with another title company, then you would tell your end buyer, hey, I typically close with this title company. Um, is that all right with you? And if they say, no, we're closing with this title company, then it's not a big deal. Don't go back and forth about it. You know, just get, just get paid at the end of the day, just get paid. So you just tell them, you know, okay, fine. We'll go with your title company. And that's why you put TBD because you don't want to lock yourself into one title company. And then you have to get an addendum sign. And that's just a whole nother process. So the seller also agrees to transfer a marketable title free and clear of all encumbrances except those listed, which will be none. You always want a free and clear title, no encumbrances listed, and pay any required state taxes or stamps required to record deed and mortgage. That being said, you know, to require to record deed and mortgage, all of that will be covered all in your, you know, if you decided to pick up the closing costs. All of that's included in closing costs, all right? So line four, damage to property. Seller should maintain property in its current condition until closing. That's so straight and forward. It doesn't, you know, there's no hidden agenda right there. It's straight and forward. Seller maintains the property in its current condition until closing. They can't go and take toilets out and take copper out and still try to sell you the house. That's not the same house that you agreed upon within this purchase agreement. Number five is a huge, huge clause. Um, you know, really, really hone into this one, right? So defaults if the buyer defaults under this contract any and all money is deposited by buyers shall be retained by seller as full liquidated damages now if the seller defaults buyer may pursue all remedies allowed by law and seller agrees to be responsible for all costs incurred by buyer as a result of seller's default so what this means is if you as the buyer default which means that you cancel outside of your 15 day inspection period then you will have to give the seller zero dollars if you negotiate it correctly and that's not obviously what we're in this for. You're in this to do good business. You're in this to be a solution provider and not a problem maker, right? You provide solutions. So just make sure you follow your inspection period, cancel within your time frame, and you'll be okay. Now, what this also means is that if you put up $1,000 and you still default on the contract, then you will have to give the seller the $1,000 and that will act as full liquidated damages because you were incapable of agreeing and following through with your purchase agreement, right? So just make sure you cancel within your time frame and you'll be good. Now, if the seller defaults, buyer may pursue all remedies allowed by law and seller agrees to be responsible for all costs incurred by buyer as a result of seller's default. So if the seller decides to, you know, have someone come to him and they say, hey, look, We'll give you $110,000. Now, seller doesn't want to answer their phone. They want to just disappear on you. Let them know, hey, look, that's a no-no. We don't do that. Because if you do want to do that, we can go that route if you want to. But if you decide to default, then I may pursue all remedies allowed by law. And you actually agreed to be responsible for all the costs incurred by me as a result of you defaulting. So if the seller ever, you know, you come by that situation just remind the seller of that line number five and that should get things back in order or they may you know try to call your bluff and see if you actually get the law involved you know and that's up to you but this contract gives you the right to do so and you know when the seller is proven that they defaulted they'll be responsible for the cost so at the very least, you can just throw that out there just to make sure they know what you can do if they decide to act funny and default on your purchase agreement. So line number six, successors and assignees. 
The terms and conditions of this contract shall bind all successors, heirs, administrators, trustees, executors, and assignees of the respective parties. Now, real quick, what this means, it's pretty straightforward, but just to break it down a bit, is that if you have a purchase and sell agreement with John and Jane Doe, but they actually pass away, I know that's a bit ironic, but, you know, if John and Jane Doe, if they pass away during the midst of your purchase and sell agreement, but they have a successor and heirs, you know, if they have an heir in their will, then the will, the heir in the will is still binded to the purchase and sell agreement. So they still have to sell you the property. Uh, so do the successors. And also, if, you know, if they have to go through a probate case, the administrators and the executors will be binded to sell you the property as well. And then let's say the seller tries to, you know, transfer the property into a trust. Um, in the midst of your purchase and sell agreement, then the trustees will still have to sell you the property because, you know, clause number six, it binds them as well. So that's, you know, straight and forward, but it protects your interest in the property. So it is important. Now, clause number seven for the inspection, buyers shall have 15 business days. Crucial, right? 15 business days turns this inspection period to three full weeks versus 15 days because 15 business days excludes Saturday and Sunday. Although the reason why you want it to be 15 business days is because it gives you more time to find your end buyer. So you actually have a 21 day inspection period versus a 15 day inspection period. And this starts from the effective date, right? So we'll go into what that means later on down the line. But this is you know pretty straightforward and also seller agrees guarantees excuse me buyer will have access to property within normal business hours during the inspection period so seller makes sure that you're able to access the property let's say 9 a.m to 5 p.m within normal business hours and for the sake of this your normal business hours will be you know monday through friday depends on how you have to uh, convey it to your seller, but ideally Monday through Friday. So if you put a lockbox on the property, obviously you can still access the property on the weekend uh, because it's 15 business days. Doesn't mean you can't access the property on the weekend. Now, buyers shall be responsible for prompt payment for such inspections and repair of damage. This just basically goes over. Don't mess up the property. Anything you mess up, you will have to pay. Now, if buyer determines in buyer sole discretion that the condition of the property is not acceptable to buyer, buyer may cancel this contract by delivering an email or text to seller prior to expiration of inspection period. So, you know, if you get into the property and you decide that it's not it's not what you want it, you don't have to give the seller a big explanation as to why you don't want to buy the property anymore. All you simply have to say is, I don't want the property. Now, what I do is actually go in for a price reduction. So I tell them, hey, look, we actually need it at this price. If they say no, then okay, cool. You know, we cancel the agreement. You send them over an email or text. And the reason why it's email or text is because some older people or some people in general, they may not have email, but they have text or vice versa. They may not have text or but they do have email. Now, if they don't have either email or text, I urge you guys to really make sure you document that you've canceled the you've canceled within your inspection period. So maybe text a close relative or send out a mailer, you know, send it through mail that you've actually canceled and you've held up. You didn't default on this uh, purchase agreement, especially if you got money up. Never default if you got money up. Always make sure that your process is documented. So as long as you do that, you will be fine. If buyer timely cancels this contract, any deposits paid should be immediately returned to buyer. And when that happens, buyer and seller should be re released of all further obligation under this contract. One thing I want to note for you guys is that some title companies, they actually require, even though that you have this line seven inspection period in here clause, they actually require you to get a release of contract signed by the seller. So this is big because if you had to put up a thousand dollars earnest money into escrow account and the seller doesn't agree to sign your release of contract, then that means, unfortunately, you will have to go to court and you will have to fight this out in court in order for you to get the $1,000 earnest money back. And that can be a real pain. So just make sure you check with the title company to make sure that they um, 
it's make sure if they require that or not. I'm not going to say don't work with a title company if they require it, but at least you know what you're getting into and you're not blindsided. All right. Now, clause number eight contract is subject to extend into closing to clear any title issues. This is, this is huge. The reason why this is huge is, you know, say if you are in the middle of closing on the property and you should be closing by May 1st, right? But you still haven't got the actual payoff from uh, the mortgage lender on the property in order for you to close. And let's say you get the payoff in on, it won't be until May 3rd, right? So if it's not in until May 3rd, then the seller, if you don't have this clause, they can actually go to the person that offered them $110,000. They can go to a person that offered them $110,000 and say, hey, my, my contract is canceled, even though you've already put title work in and you have an in buyer line up for the property. So this right here, clause eight prevents that happening. It just states that, you know, even though it's May 3rd, you're still working to clear up a title issue. So the seller is still binded legally bind it by the terms of this purchase agreement. All right. So that's huge. Just make sure you know that. And if they ask, just tell them, Hey, this is make sure that we're able to clear up any title issues and you're able to still be uh, buying it by the purchase agreement. And you know, that works both ways. You're still buying it by the purchase agreement as well as the buyer uh, to clear up any title issues. All right. So contract does not become effective until both parties have signed. Now, this is the effective date, right? So say if you as the buyer, you decide to sign this purchase agreement on the date you guys agreed upon, which is the 6th. So you sign 406-2020 and the seller doesn't sign and get the, get the purchase agreement back over to you until the 10th of April, right? So if the seller, if the seller doesn't get the purchase agreement back over to you until the 10th of April, then the con the contract inspection period doesn't start until the 10th because that's the effective date. Why is that the effective date? Because it clearly states that it does not become effective until both parties have signed. So it becomes effective at the latest date. And that's huge because if you were to sign it on the 6th and they were to sign it on the 10th and you didn't have clause number nine, then what that would mean is that you've lost four days already in your inspection period just due to the seller not signing it in time. Then you have to send an addendum to the purchase agreement. And, you know, that's just a whole other process that you want to avoid. All right. So line number 10, additional terms and conditions. If you read the ebook, you would know that this is a tip that I use. And it's really a negotiating tactic more than anything. So what you would add is buyer will pay all closing cost minus any unpaid taxes mortgages or liens so and always make sure that there's no you know red or blue make sure that your grammar is on point uh, you want to make sure it's professional and presentable at all times so this specific line, the purchase agreement template comes blank, but the this specific line allows you to pay the seller's closing costs and make sure it doesn't include any unpaid taxes, mortgages, or liens. So you get a free and clear title. Now, the way you would throw in the closing costs, don't just offer it like it's just, you know, normal, even though it is pretty normal, but don't just offer it, right? You want to throw it in and say, hey, seller, I know you want $110,000 for the property, but we can do $100,000 for the property. And we also are willing to go ahead and save you a couple hundred bucks by paying your closing costs on the property. How does that sound? You know, that's just the extra incentive for them to it lessens the blow. It lessens the ten thousand dollar blow. It tells you like, hey, look, we'll pay your ten. We'll pay the closing costs if you lower that price for us, and you know, you help me out. I help you out. So it it's it really adds an extra incentive. So don't offer it. Just offer it at the right time, not right off the bat. Just at the right time. It's a really a crucial game changer in the negotiations. So if you guys don't have to pay the closing cost and kudos to you and congratulations because you got you know extra couple hundred bucks in your pocket in addition to the money you're already walking away with but i still urge you guys to make sure that you are able to
put this in your additional terms and conditions. Always include any unpaid taxes, mortgage liens. But what you will have um, before that is seller agrees to transfer title free of any unpaid taxes, mortgages, and liens. So that you just want to reiterate that you're not paying taxes, mortgages, and liens. That way the seller knows, right? You get a free and clear title. Nothing else. Free and clear. All right? So with that being said, you're all good. And the last thing is just make sure you guys sign on the right side. Seller signs on this side. Buyer signs on this side. I've made them a rookie mistake and I've, you know, signed on uh, the buyer as a buyer signed on the seller side and have my seller sign on the buyer side. Uh, it's not a big deal, but it just doesn't look presentable, not professional. You know, it just you want to make sure everything is clean, smooth and non-confusing. So that is really uh, a good way to make sure things are non-confusing by make sure you sign on the buyer side and the seller signs on the seller side. And if not, then, you know, either print out a different version if you messed up the sign and you caught it or just decide to, you know, roll with them. Have the seller initial by their signature on the buyer side and, you know, you initial by yours on the seller side and just make sure you tell your title company that you messed up. Other than that, guys, I appreciate you taking the time to actually go through this purchase agreement. And I really hope that you guys took something from this. And thank you for giving me your time. And, you know, bottom line is let's go get paid. All right.